Hey, what's going to be? It's the Max Canadian coming back at you guys with a brand new video. And today, we are going to be going over the Detroit Red Wings Day 1 free agent signings. And in classic Iserman fashion, there was a lot. Now, I'm going to go through every single one of them, one by one, obviously. And then at the end, I've got a theory that I want to share with you guys. If you follow me on Twitter, then you probably already know what it is. But I do want to talk about it and see what everybody else's thoughts are. So... First of all, we're going to take a look at Tom Gettinger. He played for the Hartford Wolf, uh, Wolf, Hartford Wolf Pack last year in the AHL. Um, he's been in the NHL a few times. He played four games with, for zero points in 2018-2019 with the Rangers. One, po one point in two games for with the Rangers again in 2019-2021. With the Rangers again, two games, no points. And eight games, zero points with the Rangers Consistently, very small sample size. Like in total, that's what eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, four, fifteen, sixteen games. So, not a very big sample size. He's got one point in sixteen games in the NHL. It's not anything substantial. But if you look at his AHL career, they're pretty solid points. Um, he is on a two-way deal with the Red Wings for seven hundred seventy-five thousand dollars, and so it's. It's a, you know, it's not a very bad, you know, choice. It's not going to, it didn't cost us much, and he if he works out great, if he doesn't, then he doesn't. That's, that's fine. He's only signed to the Wings for, I want to say, a year. So, you know, like I said, it's not going to hurt yeah, he's signed for one year. It's not going to hurt anybody. It's He's just there to be basically a call-up. Uh, nothing else much to say. Like I said, his AHL numbers are you know pretty much half point per game for his entire career. He had eight points in nine games in the playoffs for the Wolf Pat for Hartford. And with the Sioux Greyhounds, he was pretty solid in the OHL, but a lot of people are really good in the OHL. So... Nothing to write home about here. That's why I wanted to start with him first. Much like Brogan Rafferty played in... Sorry. He played in, Coach in Coachella Valley for the Firebirds. He is currently, if I'm not mistaken, on a one-year deal as well. Two-year deal. Two years, two-day... Two years, two-way contract. Sorry, once again, I'm recording this very late at night. Uh, but he's on a two-year, two-way contract for the Wings at $775,000. Again, not a big, long shot. He's 28 years old. He's a right-handed shot D, which Detroit needed. So I could see why they made that. Made that. He was really good in uh, Coachella Valley, 51 points in 72 games. So he could, the offense is there, but it looks like he's going to be in Grand Rapids to start off the season, most likely. Uh Again, not much to say about him. He's, you know, six foot. He's a solid addition. He will be a solid addition for when the inevitable injuries hit our blue line. So, next we got probably one of the bigger signings. Uh, James Reimer, he was signed to a, I want to say, one year. Yep, yeah, signed one year to one and a half million dollars. And... I kind of like it. Um, now, I'm not going to get into whatever Reimer did last year. It seems that's all anybody wants to focus on. This is the NHL, and in the NHL, your team is a business. And in a business, you cannot play politics. It doesn't work. You cannot play the political game, and you cannot sign or not sign somebody because of their beliefs. It's just not going to happen in the NHL. If you've got skill, you're going to overlook things like that. And honestly, he did not have the best season for San Jose last year. Granted, that is behind a god-awful San Jose team, mind you. You know, that San Jose team, their best defenseman was Eric Carlson, which the points show that he's an incredible offensive defenseman. But in my opinion, Carlson is basically a forward posing as a defenseman. That is what he is. He cannot play defense for the life of him. He, I think he had an average of like 20 seconds on the power play. So, or not the power play, the penalty kill. So it's, you can't really give Reimer too much grief. And he, I mean, if you look at his stats, he's a consistent over 900 player. Like this was definitely a down year for him. And yes, he is 35 years old. 
but we do need a veteran goaltending in our in our program. Like Huso's solid, but I think Huso's what 28, 29 years old. Uh, he might be a little older than that, a little younger. I don't exactly know at this point, but Reimer will be a great backup to Huso. We've seen Huso can play fantastically when he's fresh, but if he plays more than what you know he probably should, he does fall off quite a bit. So, like I said, Reimer, great addition, and we'll see how it goes. Hopefully, he can get back to this plus nine, this over nine hundred status. It would be great if he could go to nine twenty, nine thirty eight. That would be dope. But I'm not expecting it. I'm expecting more of the 906, 911. You know, even straight 900 would be better than what we've had for a while. So Reimer, I think, is a great signing, and people need to lay off of it straight up. Next, we have Alex Lyon, who I think was an incredible signing, especially for what we got him for. We got him for 900,000 for, I want to say, two years. Um, let me double check that. Yes, two years. And it's a two-way contract, I believe. Um, so he's likely going to start the season in Grand Rapids, and he will end up making his way up. He Obviously, he was a massive part of why Florida made the playoffs this year. Uh, if it wasn't for him stepping in when Bob Ro- when Knight got injured and Bobrovsky couldn't do the job he was paid for, he stepped up. 914 save percentage in 15 games. Those 15 games are what got Pittsburgh, not Pittsburgh, Florida, into the playoffs. And he's a very solid three goaltender. Um, honestly, I think he would be a better. Uh, honestly, I think he'd be better a better backup than Reimer. You know, obviously he's younger and he's proved himself. But I'm not going to hold my breath too much. Reimer has also proved himself, and he is, like I said, the veteran goaltender that this team needed. Uh, I'm excited for Lyon. He's big boy-ish, you know, six foot one, not massive. You know, he's not Helberg size, but he's big enough to be the Detroit goaltender, and it's only a nine hundred thousand dollar cap hit. So he is going to be our he will be our de facto three third goaltender. Because, honestly, I'm expecting somebody to get injured. It's just going to happen. But, yes, Alex Lyon, probably one of the best signings Eisenman did. And trust me, there are some very questionable signings here that we are going to get to. Uh, but this one is not one. Daniel Sprong, $2 million for one year, I believe. And I do not hate it. I actually really like this. Daniel Sprong played really solid for Seattle. 46 points, 21 goals, 25 25- assists in 66 games he had two goals in the playoffs and yes he he did great things for seattle uh a career high in seattle i believe as far as the nhl goes and i really like it he's 26 years old so he's younger than larkin and from what i've seen he's not the fastest skater in the world but he's great i expect him to Honestly, I expect him to go 46 to 50 points. Straight up. If we can get 46 points on the, Se- on, Se- on the Seattle team, which, mind you, that Seattle team was really good. They were very well-rounded. But Detroit, I think, has the ability to elevate him more. Because you can only do so much when everybody's on the same level, and there are players on Detroit that are a better level than Sprong. Like, I think Raymond's a better on a better level than Sprong. You got Cider. Some of the new signings we have are going to be better. Wallman, Larkin... Bergeron, you know, they're all going to be able to elevate each other, and I think that's great. Sprong will work out very well with Detroit, and honestly, if he performs well enough, it's a $2 million cap hit now. If he performs well enough, I imagine he'll want to raise, but I wouldn't mind bringing him back next year either, if, you know, we're able to. Next, we got JT Comfer, which is an, a Matt, I like, I like the deal. I do like the signing, Kind of. If he, he he's at a cap at a five point one million for one year, I believe. I believe it's one year. I'm gonna double check that right now. Uh, five year. Never mind. Five years. I was way off on that one. I don't know why I thought one year. Probably because of who's coming up next. But I don't hate it. I do think we de- we definitely overpaid for JT Comfer. Like. 
what other who else is going to get 5.1 million dollars for 5 years after getting 52 points that's not even a point per game most point per game players make about what Larkin's making realistically but I don't know if I would pay a guy whose high was 52 points and hasn't even ever come close to that in the rest of in his entire NHL career do I hate the signing no uh, Comfort played center. I think he was Colorado's second or third line center last year because of injuries, obviously. And it's it's he'll he'll suffice, I believe. Uh, he will either be our second or third line center, obviously. And this de- it largely depends on who makes that out of training camp. If Casper makes that out of training camp, Casper will be one of our centers. So that leaves you with the question, do you have your centers be Larkin, Kompfer, Kopp, and then Casper? Or do you keep Valeno as your fourth line center, move Casper up to the third or even the second line? And with either way, you're going to have Kompfer and Kopp sitting there. And I believe Kopp is the better face-off guy, in my opinion. I, I think the stats may prove it as well. Cop is a much better face-off guy. He's one of the best face-off guys in the league. Sue me. Whether the stats prove that or not, I still believe it. And we haven't seen everything out of Cop yet. But if Casper does make it, he will be a center. So the question is, do they keep Valeno as the fourth-line center? Or do they move Casper down there? I don't think they'll put Casper as the fourth-line center. Honestly, if he makes it out of training camp... He will realistically be our second or third line center. That's just that's just what's going to happen. So, do you? I believe Comfort will be put on the wing at that point, regardless of who his center is. I believe Comfort will be put on the wing, which is not bad. He is a right winger. We need right wingers. And like I said, he was only put in the center position on, in Colorado because of injury. So, if he can keep up this fifty plus point pace, I think, especially with the cap going up. You know, in a few uh, significantly in the 2024 2025 season, at least reportedly it's supposed to, this contract will be able to be stomached a bit more. Plus, if need be, he's a good trade piece. So, all right, next we've got Shane Gobstashire. Gobst is here. We've got Ghost. I can never pronounce his name right. He is signed to a one year deal. For four point one two five million dollars, and he, I don't have much to say. Like I can't, I can't say I don't have much to say. He is a great signing. My only problem with this is now we have too many defensemen, which is a good problem to have, except when one of the defensemen that's going to be fighting for a position next season is Edvinson. And it was, up until now, it was pretty much confirmed Edvinson was going to make the final night roster. So, I'm trying to figure out where this all comes in. Because you can't put Edvinson as a healthy scratch, because then, what's the point of calling him up? So, do you move Mata to, to a, and swap hit Mata and, you know, Gobstashire out? Or Mata, Sherat, Mata, whoever? You know, who do you... Who do you swap out to make room for Edmondson? It's, I don't know, but Gobstashire, he's a solid addition. He will likely end up on the third line, on the third pairing D. And as you can see, he's put up some pretty, you know, respectable points. Uh, obviously, he's thirty years old, so he's on the older side, five uh, eleven, which isn't a big deal realistically. And if like I said, you look at his record, 2014-2015, he didn't do much because that was his rookie year, but 2015-2016, 46 points in 64 games, 2016-17 with Philly, 39 games 76 points, 65 points, 65 points in 78 games with Philly in 2017-18, 37 in 78 games, 2018-19, he dropped off there, and then I think he got sent down to the AHL apparently. And then, you know, he scored 50 points with Arizona in 2021-2022. That was nice. And 31 points with Arizona this season before he got traded to Carolina for... And he just got 10 points in 23 games. So he is at a defenseman level points, you know, point percentage, basically. He's basically at close to, at least, 
half point close to or over half point a game in most of his career, which is what you can expect from most of your defensemen. You know, every not every defenseman is going to be Kale McCarr, Adam Fox, Eric Carlson levels of offense. It's just not going to happen. That's not what's in the dis- the defenseman job description. And I think Shire could work out really well. If you slap him next to Mata, it's all over for everybody. So that's but that's that's where one of my big concerns come in and why we have why I'm confused at the future for our blue line coming up this season because this next signing is probably the worst signing out of all of them. I don't know what Eisenman was thinking here, but we got Justin Hall signed to what was it? Three years at three point four million dollars, I believe. Yeah, three years at three point four million. Which I mean, he's right-handed D. We need right-handed D. But why did it have to be Hall? Like, I don't, I don't like. This is really the only time I've legitimately questioned Iserman's you know, grabs. I mean, it's not the only time. Obviously, I'm a realist. I can see bad moves when they're made. The Schrott contract, while, yes, at first I thought it would be solid, I, you know, I can open my eyes and see that that was a bad contract. That's largely because I didn't really follow Schrott too much, but I can tell that's a bad contract, and unless Schrott pulls his head out of his ass somehow this next season and, you know, does something. And unfortunately, I think this might be another Schrott situation. With Schrott, all of the tools are there, but he just can't put them together properly and do what he can do. It's the same deal with Hall. All of the tools are there. He is a big guy at six foot four. He's the same height as Cider. Hall will likely be on the third line. He's a big guy, not afraid to hit things. And I like that. But he gets burned so, so many times. And that is not what Detroit needs. We dealt with that way too much last season with our third pairing because our third pairing was regularly a combination of Lindstrom, Lindstrom, Osterley, and Hack. You know, at the beginning of the season, Mata was back there, but at the beginning of the season, we had Philip Hironik for the second line for the second line D with Mata. But then, you know, moves happened. Wallman came back, stuff like that. So, it's. I hope I'm wrong. I really do hope I'm wrong. He has potential, obviously. I mean, if you look at his records it, up in the NHL, you know, 2017-20, I can't really do much there because it looks like he was just a call-up. But, I mean, 18, 20, 23 points, the potential's there. But, because like I said, for a third-pairing demon, you don't need, you're not looking for points, straight up. Because, Oli Mata, I think, is be- far better than Justin Hall. And this was about the point production that Mata had. So, like I said, I hope I'm proved wrong, but at this cap hit for $3.4 million for three years, I cannot see him living up to that. I just can't. And it's unfortunate because that's not what this defense needs. This defense needed solid, a solid veteran presence, which we had in Sherratt and Mata. Schrott, you know, it, it, I've already talked about my gripes with him, but Schrott, veteran defenseman, knows what he's talking about. Mata, veteran defenseman, he elevates everybody he plays with. He even elevated Schrott when they were playing with him at the end of the season. But it's it it's a bit more palpable with that. With Hall, he's likely going to get paired up next to Gobstashire, or Sherratt, or which I hope that doesn't happen. I really do not want Sherratt and Hall to be paired together. That would just be probably detrimental to everybody's health. Like, it would be detrimental to whoever they're playing against health, because they are miserable to play against. It'd be detrimental to probably Lalone and Bugner's health, because they will likely have brain aneurysms watching that happen. It'll be detrimental to all of us fans' health because we will have brain aneurysms trying to watch that ha- car, ra- car crash. So I, I don't get it. This this was 
one of those very few times, because don't get me wrong, I trust Eisenman's vision for the team. He's building it out from the blue line first. But it get, it's getting to the point where we have far too many defensemen to, you know, to justify continuously building up on it. We need to start focusing on forwards and goal scoring, and we have not done that. Like, I don't think we, like, we signed Kim Costin. Like, he's not up here, but Kim Costin is, uh, because, I mean, I'm not, I didn't put him, put him up here because I figured that everybody knew he was going to get signed and looked up his stats already anyways, like everybody probably did with this stuff. But regardless, Kim Costin's going to be a solid addition to the bottom six, which we needed. We needed bottom six. We do need bottom six talent that can produce regularly, which is why I was such a big fan of Suter. But we needed people to fill out that top six. Right now, our top six is looking like first line, Larkin, Raymond, and probably Perron again. And then our second line is looking to be Kopp, Kopfer, and Kubelik. Like, that's not a bad top six, but it's not a winning top six. Like, I mean, it, well, it's not a playoff winning top six, I should say. That that's a regular season top six, I would say. That is a solid regular season top six. But at the end of the day, it doesn't solve our problem of not being able to score goals. Comfer has the ability to score goals. Larkin, we all know, can score goals. You know, Kubli can score goals, but he's inconsistent at it. There's so many players that we have that can score goals, but we don't have enough players that we know will score a goal. We don't have enough, we don't have any players that once that buck gets on their stick, they will, there's a 95% chance that puck's going in the back of the net. We don't have that player. Which is what brings me to my conspiracy theory. My theory, and it's a bit of a long shot, I'll say. I posted this on Twitter earlier. But I believe Iserman has acquired a lot of these pieces for a reason. I believe Iserman picked up guys like Hall, guys like Gobstashire, guys like Sprong and Reimer, or even Rafferty. I believe Iserman picked up a few of these guys to move them. Straight up, I think that's what is going on. The talks with the Brinkett have reportedly not gone very well. And that's largely due, at least if the reports are to believe... That's largely due to Ottawa not letting Debrinket's team talk with other teams until Ottawa gets a deal that they feel is fair for getting Debrinket. Now, your opinions on that as it may be, we all know that Iserman, if he doesn't feel like a deal is good, he has no problem waiting people out and being a stubborn mule. Which is great. We love that about Eisenman. We love that he doesn't take bad deals. Or if he does, it's not very often. So, my theory is he acquired some of these guys to help try and suit Ottawa's needs and come up with a better deal. That's my opinion. Some of these guys, like I said, are one, two, year, one, two three year deals. And it's a lot of defensemen. I think Eiserman knows that he, like, he literally just signed more defensemen than we have room for. And that's not counting guys like Johansson, Wallander, and Edvinson who are going to be fighting for spots. You don't sign all these guys and assume that these guys, and especially to that much, you definitely do not sign Hall for $3.4 million for three years and assume you're going to shove them in Grand Rapids. That's not what you sign these guys for. So... I believe he signed some of these guys to package with Ottawa. Like I said, a lot more defense than we need. Package around there. You know, you could throw Hall, Reimer, and... Well, they just signed Corpusolo, so maybe not Reimer. But, you know, Hall, Zadina, and a draft pick or two. You know, we've still got Boston's first round next year. And let's be real, guys. It's still practically the same Boston team. Yeah, they likely won't have Bertuzzi, Burris, Ron, or Krejci. I think Krejci was there. I do, don't quote me on that. I forgot already. But they will be roughly the same team. Like I said, yes, no Burris, Ron, likely no Bertuzzi. 
you know, Taylor Hall's gone, but they all were also very active in the playoffs. In the playoffs, and the f- they weren't active at all in the playoffs. Fucking free agency. They were really active in free agency, so it was like it's likely going to be a very hot, very low first round pick. Like it's gonna be mid at best. And even if it is top ten, we don't get that until twenty until you know the year after. We won't have that for the twenty twenty four draft. It'll be a twenty twenty five first round draft pick. So you know, it's I, that's that's just my belief. I think Eiserman got a lot of these guys to make a move and even if it isn't for Ottawa I believe he got some of these guys to package in with some other assets like as Phillips Adina and a draft pick to tr- make a bigger trade to fix the goal scoring problem that is just my take on it and like I said it is a cons- it is a tinfoil conspir- long shot conspiracy but it is the best thing I think the red w- it's what I think Eisenman would do we all know Eisenman has a habit of playing 4D chess when everyone's playing 2D checkers. Like, it's incredible the way his brain works. So, that's just my theory. I'd love to hear your guys' theory uh, or theories. I'm sure a lot of you guys have more than one theory. I as well. But that's just my biggest theory and craziest theory that I've come up with. And, yeah, so let me know what you guys think. Let me know what, you, like I said, what your guys' theories are, what you guys think about each signing. I can pretty much tell everybody's thoughts on the Hall signing. Everybody's very vocal about it. But, regardless, thank you guys so much for watching. My name is the Mexinadian, and I will talk to you guys later. Adios.